Well, welcome to our lesson preview. Uh, we're still studying, and we just started studying the, uh, the new lessons for this quarter, entitled Stewardship, Motives of the Heart. And so we want to look at uh, lesson number three for this coming week, and we welcome you to our study today, and especially those that are watching, uh, our viewers, we welcome you too. And as we go through the lesson, Remember, it's the high points that we will touch on, and you be faithful in doing your study, and that will enhance your understanding of the subject, and I know that God is going to bless us as we open His Word in talking about God or mammon. So let's say a prayer before we begin. Dear Father, thank you so much for this uh, opportunity we have of looking again into your Scripture that teaches us so much about you, and especially about the subject of stewardship, how we need to uh, be good stewards uh, of what you have entrusted us to look after, not only our funds to return to you faithfully, but also in all other aspects of taking care of what you entrusted to us while we are on this earth. So open our hearts, open our minds, let us know and understand your will for us. In Jesus' name, amen. So, so today, uh, we want to look at the subject of the choice that we need to make as to who we will serve. In fact, the lesson is all about worship. Worship. Who will we decide to worship the God who created everything, including us, human beings? Or will we worship the created stuff and things that does not really matter for our salvation in this life? And right from the very beginning in Scripture, we see this theme, the topic of worship. Genesis, in an exodus, in the Ten Commandments, we find... The fourth commandment clearly tells us about who we ought to worship. And the theme carries on all the way through Revelation. Chapter 14 of Three Angels' Messages, where it points us back to the Creator God. Who will we worship? As we are struggling with the great controversy between good and evil, it's really a struggle between who will have our hearts, who will have our worship, who will have our possessions, all the way through Scripture. So, you know, humankind was, in fact, designed for worship. And that worship may be directed towards self. Uh, the worship may be directed to the created things, as we said, or it may be directed towards the, the Creator, and the truth is that the only option that brings satisfaction and a deep sense of belonging and purpose is the worship of a true and loving Creator God. And therefore, the fundamental truth is we cannot serve two masters. It's going to have to be the one or the other. Serving God and serving money are mutually exclusive actions. It's one or it's the other. Like we said, it's going to have to be God or mammon. So we have a choice to make. And the longer we hesitate, making excuses or procrastinating, the stronger the hold that money and the love of money will have over us. And either choice requires the faith factor. Either choice requires the faith factor. So let us begin right there. Faith requires a decision. Faith requires a decision. 
And so we want to go to the Bible and look at an instance here in Luke chapter 21. Luke chapter 21, and we're going to read the two verses, three verses, two, three, and four. Luke 21, verses 2 through 4. We know this well-known story. Jesus said this. Uh, verse 2 says, And he saw a certain poor widow putting in two mites, and he said, Truly I say to you, this poor widow has put in more than all. For all these out of their abundance have put an offering for God, but she out of her poverty put in all the livelihood that she had. Now we know the instance about this. Jesus was there at the temple, and people it was time to come and give their gifts. And Jesus noticed this poor widow. She did not ask, where will I get my next meal from if I give my last two mites? How will I pay my bills? Will I be able to have enough if I need to purchase something for the house, for the home? She trusted God, and I suspect I suspect that she had done this many times before. She had faith that God would supply all of her needs. And so she made the choice. She had faith and she made the choice that I will give, even if it's my last, to God's cause and he will take care of me. So there's another instance that we need to look at in the same book of Luke, Dr. Luke, uh, chapter 19. Luke chapter 19. And the whole story is written there from verses 1 through 10. And it's about a man named Zacchaeus. Somebody want to read that for us very quick? One through ten. Yes. Chapter 19. Yes. Jesus entered and passed through Jericho. And behold, there was a man named Zacchaeus, which was the chief among the publicans, and he was rich. And he sought to see Jesus who he was, and could not for the press, because he was little of stature. And he ran before, and he ran before, and climbed up into a sycamore tree to see him, for he was to pass that way. And when Jesus came to the place, he looked up and saw him and said, Unto the gates, make haste and come down, for today I must abide at thy house. And he made haste and came down and received him joyfully. And when they saw it, they all murmured, saying, That was God. He was gone to be guest with a man that is a sinner. And Zacchaeus stood and said unto the Lord, Behold, Lord, the half of my goods I give to the poor, and if I have taken anything from any man by false accusation, I restore him fourfold. And Jesus said unto him, This day is salvation come to this house, for so much as he also is a son of Abraham. For the Son of Man is come to seek and to save that which was lost. Mm -hmm. So here we see yes, Zacchaeus, when he knew and came to understand that Jesus was in fact the person that he said he was, he made sure he came to see who Jesus was. And even though his stature prevented him because there were many, many people there that day, he was so determined to see Jesus. He climbed this tree and said, I can just put my eyes on him. Something was propelling him to do this act. He said, I've got a choice. I can go home. I can forget about it. But no, I am going to make sure 
I see Jesus. And did Jesus see him? Yes. Jesus saw him. Jesus knew the man's heart. Jesus knew he was looking for something different uh, that he did not have. And so the Holy Spirit took a hold of that seed and planted that in him. And when Zacchaeus had a change of heart after meeting Jesus, he was prepared to give half of his goods to the poor. Change of heart. And to restore fourfold to those that he cheated, he said. He did not say, well, I'll give it back and, and I'm sure I will find a way to make up all my losses again. He didn't say that. Oh, let, let, me, let me take this gamble. I'll give and let's hope I... No, 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 no. He placed his faith and trust in Jesus. And Jesus knew he was sincere. Hence, the beautiful commendation from the Savior. Jesus said, today, today, salvation has come to this house. The case made the decision. He, made, he showed his faith in Jesus. But let me tell you this. A sure sign that we are not attached to the wealth or the possessions of this world is when you and I trust God enough to let our possessions glorify Him and strengthen His cause on this earth. Amen. The thing is, God just doesn't want us to be a steward. He just doesn't want us to be a steward. But he wants us to be a good steward. Not just a steward. This is your title. But God wants us to be a good steward. So let me ask the question. What constitutes a good student? Steward. What is a good steward? A good steward is a, you know how to manage the resources, the time, yes. the talent that God has, uh, you know, left in our own to manage, that we can use it for His glory. It's not to glorify ourselves, yes. but we make it useful whatever He has um, they taken or what responsibility has given us to make everything resources that we have for his glory yes. that, like uh, we don't hold anything like we could surrender everything to him yes yes that is a difference between a steward and a good steward right not just the steward that does and gives what is required that is a steward to give back what is required, right? But a good steward is willing, like you say, to go above and beyond. To go above and beyond. Also, let's stay in Luke. We're still in Luke chapter 16. Let's go there real quick. Luke 16, just to bring out the point. Luke 16 verse 10. He who is faithful in what is least is faithful also in much. And he who is unfaithful and just in what is least is yes. unjust also in much. <laughs> you see, the good steward is not just satisfied with, uh, with, with doing the job, getting it done, but looking, he's looking for the details. He's faithful. He's faithful in, 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 in not only in the little, in the least, but also in much. He, 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 he likes to do the detail. He goes the extra mile. You know? And, and not just saying, well, you asked me to give 10, so I gave you 10, so that should be okay, right? No, 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 no. God is looking for that faithful, good steward that says, hey, I'm, they, they, they told me to sweep the floor, but maybe I should just polish the floor. It would look nicer. That's a good steward. And if the, if the master owns some good stewards, the business runs beautiful because everybody is doing their best. They are there on time. They're supposed to clock in at 8 o'clock. 
but they clock in at a quarter to eight. They're supposed to leave at five. Some of them leave at 10 after five, why? Because they make sure the windows is closed. They make sure the, the lights are off. That is a good steward. The boss wouldn't say anything if it's five, you have to leave. That's what your time, you get paid up to five. But now you are a better person. You're a very good steward because you look at all these little details, the least as well. You know, Ellen White in Prophets and Kings, Patriarchs and Prophets, I'm sorry, page 222, 223, I think you have that quote there. She says, there are few who realize the influence of the little things of life upon the development of character. Nothing with which we have to do is really small. So, so even those little things that we may say, oh, well, you know, that those little things are the things that really matter because character is formed not by the big things and the big issues of life, but taking care of the little details, of the little details of life. So that's, that's, that's what we mean by what constitutes a good steward, is a person that can take care of the big issues and also of the little issues. You see, God wants to do a very special work in us. And when we trust Him, when we trust Him, He wants to reinstate us to the position we had in Eden. That's His ultimate goal. Adam and Eve were stewards. And God gave them and trusted this whole new creation into their care. So when you and I are faithful, in the little things and we become good stewards, then God can give us the bigger things. He wants to entrust it to us, to bring us back to the position we had in Eden, good stewards over all of his creation, not only over one section. So we want to understand that perfectly. You know, God has in mind that to, to raise us to the level of the steward that we ought to be and that we can be. Not just getting by with, oh, this is what you want me to do. I've done it. You know, you want me to return a tithe? Well, I've given a tithe. Oh, oh yes, you mentioned, by the way, offerings. Well, I give offerings. Well, it doesn't stop there. The good steward goes above and beyond. Yeah. That's what, when, when God sees that, he'll entrust more to us because you are faithful. I can see that if I hand you this, you'll be able to handle it well. Okay, so let's look at the, the next part. Uh, God and mammon, right? And that's the title of the lesson. So let's, let, let's go to Matthew chapter 6, verse 24. Go over to Matthew chapter 6 and we look at Verse 24. If somebody has it, maybe you can read it for us. Matthew 6, 24, and it's well-known text. And serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or else he will hold to the one and despise the other. Ye cannot serve God and mammon. That's what he says, right? Right? And, 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 you know, just for clarification's sake about this word mammon, this word mammon, you know, mammon came from the Greek word, actually, meaning uh, mamanos. That, that's what it, what it uh, means in Greek, which translates, of course, to money and uh, wealth and material possessions. And but that's not mammon referred to the God of wealth. Right. That's the name of a God. Yeah, it's true. So you, have, you cannot serve two gods. You have exactly God right. Or mammon, the earthly possessions of men. Exactly right. Exactly right. And, and in biblical culture, the word mammon carried a very negative connotation, you know. It did. The, the leaders did not understand this concept really well. They did not. And so when Jesus spoke to the multitude while on earth, the leaders included, he did not merely throw words around, you know. 
Jesus was very careful and very meticulous when he spoke. Even those stories that he told, you know, those, those uh, uh, parables were very, very well thought out, you know, in every word. No wonder he says, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word. Then I often think about that, and when I read scripture, I make sure I read, I'm not sure, do I have all the words read? <laughs> then it comes back to mind, by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of the Lord, because every word has been well chosen. It may be a simple story, every word is chosen, you know. And so when Jesus was in this earth, like we say, he didn't just throw these things around. And it is significant that he used mammon at least four times in the New Testament. It's significant that he did, you know. The word mammon, that's what he did. And so, uh, when he used it, when he used this word, he did not simply refer to money, as we now know, right? He deliberately used the word mammon to show us what happens when we become attached to money, when we become attached to riches and possessions. You know? Because God. Exactly right. So, so that's why he, when he used that word, he wanted them to get the idea that, you know, if you build your hope, build your trust, what you're really doing is, it becomes a God to you. It becomes a God to you. Because money, if it, and if, if money is a God, then materialism is its religion. When we, when we go after material stuff, we begin to worship it. Right? And so the devil just knows he hides behind those dollars, those bank accounts, the stuff that we own and have, and he just knows how to get us. And so we need to be alert. We need to be wise. And we need to make a decision, like we said, as, as we started the lesson today, that we should know that it's a choice that we need to make. Is it going to be mammon, or is it going to be the Creator God? So the next part of the lesson that I thought was interesting for us to talk about today is the gift of material possessions. Why do I call it a gift? Why do I call it a gift of material possessions? Because we never had it in the first place. Okay. All right. So it comes later in life. All right. Because everything comes from God. Exactly right. Right? It, it, God has given us the gift of being, of having stuff. Now, then the next question is, just to be clear, is it a sin to own things? No. When does it become a sin? Uh, yes. When, when the stuff you have owns you, then the problem begins. Yeah, when the stuff you have owns you, then it becomes a problem. But God has given all these things, you know? Material things in and of itself are not evil. Unlike some religion, religions, you know, that will teach that the material world and the stuff in it are all bad and evil, and that only spiritual things are good. Isn't that how the other side approaches things? That, that, that the world is bad. You know, just cut yourself off from the world. Excuse me. And we have these people who don't want to mingle, who don't want to live in this world. And uh, people who live out, out by themselves, in the monasteries, other places, they want to be by themselves, quietly there. Just have one pair, a set of clothes. Just eat simple foods. Is that God's idea of having them get closer to Him? Not at all. Yeah. God wants, God wants us to be around and to enjoy the stuff 
that he has given. And so we need to remind ourselves that the Bible values the material world. The Bible values the material world. After all, Jesus himself created this world, didn't he? How then can it be evil? How can it be evil? He created it. John 1, 1 to 3 tells us that clearly, doesn't it? What does it say? John 1, 1 to 3, very, very uh, well-known scriptures. What does it say? Yes, 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 yes. 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 So, so he made everything. God made the world and everything there is in it. Jesus is the creator. And the earth is just a mere example of what he has made. If you read in Genesis chapter 1, 1, Genesis chapter 26, 31, when God created the world, it was very good. Everything was good. The Bible says in Genesis. But when did the bad thing come up? Like the bad thing. Uh, yeah, 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 yeah. The bad is good for you. Well, because... When was the bad thing created? Okay. That's true. Remember when sin came in? When sin came into this world, things changed. Man now used the good. And Satan and the devil is very good at doing that, right? It takes something good that God has given, and then he puts a slant on it, you know. He, 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 does, he, he turns it around. But the bad was only present in the new world. That's true. When Columbus came, he found the Indians smoking tobacco. Yes, the yes, and yes. And he to Europe where they smoke it. All right. And, and the same with, with, the, with drinking. Yeah. I mean, everybody enjoyed the fruit of the vine in the beginning. Beautiful, fresh, grape juice. But then the devil said, hey, Ned, that, you guys are missing out on it. That, this stuff should have a kick. Then, then, you'll, then you'll have a kick. <laughs> then you'll enjoy life better. You see, the devil will always do that. You know? But God, that wasn't God's intention. right? So there it is. So God gave us the gift of this world. This, this world was a gift. And everything in it was a gift. And then in Genesis chapter 2, let's go there and find out another gift that God gave us. A gift from God. Right, right. In the midst of the sinful world, what did he give us? Genesis chapter 2, 1, 2, and 3. What does it say? What does it say? <laughs> Genesis chapter 2. Yes. Yes. And on the seventh day, God made yeah. his work which he had made. Yes. And he rested on the seventh day from all his work which he had made. Yes. And God blessed the seventh day and sanctified it yes. because in it he had rested from all his work which God created and made. Oh, he gave us the gift of the Sabbath. Wow, what a gift. What a gift. So, so let me ask you this. How, how does the Sabbath provide an opportunity to keep a healthy perspective about life? How does the Sabbath do that? Regenerates us. Yes. But Adam and Eve never needed regeneration. They were made on the sixth day and then rest. Yes. The next day was the Sabbath. Yes. So on the sixth day they were created, they are full of life. Yes. A lot of energy. Yes. They probably didn't sleep the whole night yes. because of the energy they have. Right. Well, there was no night there, right? No, there was night there. In this earth there was. In the new, and, and, uh, yeah, you know? but but I mean, they, uh, yeah, night nighttime wasn't created for for them to sleep, because they, were they tired? Probably not, because they were made in the sixth day. Yeah, was was Jesus tired after creating? No. And and yet he said, he, uh, this is the day for rest, right? right? So it was a gift for us to remember him by, so that we can worship him. So what a what a wonderful what a wonderful gift. What do we do on a Sabbath to bring us back to to the topic of worshiping God? What do we do on a Sabbath? 
apart from the worshipping God on the Sabbath, what else is the is Sabbath good for? Fellow it's fellowship? It just keeps the, uh, uh, us in a perspective of uh, time spent with God yes. and, and working to, to obtain material things. Yes. Uh, because we, take, we intentionally take off the day yes. of working for ourselves to yes. spend time with God. Yes. That's true. But, and it's a time to look at his creative powers and to say to ourselves, he really deserves our adoration and praise and worship. A time for reflection, right? Time for reflection. A time for mind and body rest, right? Basking in the sunshine of his love. What a gift the Sabbath is to us, you know? And if it was only for the Sabbath, I'd say, God it reminds us of the great creative power that you have in giving us the Sabbath. We will worship you. But that's a decision that we must make, right? That's a decision that we must make. We don't just worship him because he said we should, but because he loves us and we love him back, that we will worship on the Sabbath day. All right, so... so uh, the next thing we need to talk about is let's look at some of the counsels that come from Jesus himself about material possessions. Let's look at some of the counsels he gives us there. And the first place I think we should look at, for me, is uh, go back to Luke again. Dr. Luke has got some beautiful insights. Luke chapter 12. Luke chapter 12. And there's a story that Jesus, that Jesus tells here about this one gentleman who uh, had much and all he thought was about m making bigger bonds to fill the much that he had. 12 verses 15 through 21. Somebody want to read that? F 15 to 21. And Jesus said, And he said to them, on verse 15, Take heed and beware of covetousness, for one's life does not consist in the abundance of things that he possesses. And then he spoke this parable, saying to them, The ground of a certain rich man yielded plentifully, and he thought within himself, saying, What shall I do? since I have no room to store my crops. And so he said, I will do this. I will pull down my barns, and I will build bigger barns, or greater ones, and there I will store all my crops and my goods. And I will say to myself, Soul, you have many goods laid up for many years. Now you take your ease, eat, drink, and be merry. But God said to him, Fool, this night your soul will be required of you, and then whose will these things be which you have provided? So is he who lays up treasure for himself and is not rich toward God. So, uh, what, what do you see in the story? What, what jumps out yet at you in the story? Of the what? What did he do wrong? You know, some may question that. I mean, if you if your field is healing much, and shouldn't you shouldn't you store some? Is it wrong to save some for a rainy day in case you need it? Uh, what what's wrong? What's wrong with this whole thing? Why did? Okay. Yes. Yes. You could, uh, you could, all, you could be wealthy yeah. and take it just for also in, in using it to serve God, not yeah. yourself. Okay. Well, not just timing, but also hedging. Okay. This farmer yeah. had a lot of harvest. Yes. But when his barn was too small. Yes. Well, there was no futures market at the time. He could not sell in the futures market his produce. Okay. So 
therefore, you have to build a bigger bank to store it. Okay. If there was a future market, you could have sold whatever is in excess okay. in, the, in the future market. All right. And you didn't have to worry about uh, the bigger bank. But oh. it is not now. now. Now you can do it. Yeah. In this age, we have the future market. But back then, they didn't have They didn't have one. Okay, good. Good answers to, to there now. Yeah, there was a law Rich? that yeah. they that they had in, in Hebrew. Yes. And then uh, Boaz was following that law when he left uh, some behind for a roof to glean. Yes. So it was a rule that if you have excess, then you give it to the poor. Yes. And the poor were plentiful. I'm sure they had plenty of poor people. Oh, sure. To divide it out and say, I have, I have an excess. Yes. So here, you know, he could have done that right from the beginning. Yeah. The other thing is that um, he was planning on sitting back and doing nothing, okay. taking ease. Okay. I'm just going to, you know, I'm not going to work hard anymore. And uh, that's where uh, God really held him accountable. You know, uh, I can go on vacation, there's pleasure, there's leisure, and uh, yeah. uh, like uh, the Belshazzar party. Yes. Everything is plentiful, that's, that's just party for right now. And, and then God held him accountable for that time as well as his excess um, yeah. wealth. Okay, good. And, and, and that's really, and you were right, and, and of course your point is well taken too, but that is really the heart of the, of the answer here. His whole attitude, his whole attitude, he was just thinking of self. Right. That's myself. He, it was me. And that's the problem with possessions. Right. We want to please self. Whenever we go after stuff, you know, greed comes in, you have enough, but you want more. Right? And, and uh, you don't stop at getting more. If you see somebody else have something, you even desire that. You don't really need it, but because it's available, you, you just want it. Like our lesson said for today, right? You see, you want, and then you take. And here his attitude was totally wrong. I'll build bigger bonds. When he knew the poor was just down the street here. He didn't leave anything for the poor. I'll sit back and I'll enjoy and I'll, uh, you know, while I have everything, who cares about those who don't have? And that's not our God. He cares about everybody. He cared enough about me, a sinner, to save me, to go to the cross for me. And here, I'm holding all these things. I don't care about my neighbor or the, or the poor that need. And they totally lost the, the lesson. But Jesus saw this and brought the story, and I'm so glad he did, because now I see myself, and you can see yourself, you know. Yeah, as long as our bonds are full, as long as we're nice and dry, who cares about those who need things, you know. And uh, I'm sorry to say sometimes that pervades right in the church among us. We don't even care much for our church family sometimes. We know there are people who are struggling. Do we step up to the plate? Do we send a bag of groceries when we know there's a need? Can we help with the rent for some mother, single mother who has two or three kids who's struggling? Do I even make a call? Do I even visit? Those are the things, like we said in the beginning, the difference between a steward and a good steward. Right? A steward will just give what is being asked for to give. But a good steward goes above and beyond. Look at the difference. The difference. You know? Even God himself ties in the middle of the second yeah. one verse with this one. Yes, yes. And then the other second one he ties in in verse one is where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. His heart was not with God. Yeah, yeah, he's married, let's have a party. And <laughs> that, just, I, I've got everything nice sewn up in my house. I'm nice and warm, I'm dry, I'm happy. I don't care about my neighbor, you know. So why does God call him a fool? Why does he call him a fool? Because he was a fool. Yeah, he was a fool. He didn't think beyond. He was just thinking of me, 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 myself, you know. You know, and that was the big problem. But he never thought beyond earth. He yes. never thought um, a, a, a judgment. Yes. And being held accountable yeah. for what he did. Absolutely. Just year and now. I'm living for year and now, you know. 
And, and that's a serious problem because God's people are not exempt from this. We, we just think of ourselves and, and living for now. So, and that's a serious problem because I, I see we even raising a generation of kids that think that everything is, must just be done. You know, sometimes we spoil our kids. I mean, we step on toes many times, but we spoil our kids to the point where they don't, they don't know that they are, the other half doesn't live like we do. They get everything they ask for. You know, they, they, uh, things are done for them all the time. And is that the way to raise them? Should they know that they should share? That you just don't get everything you ask for? You know, and we build our homes and we, we get, have our, 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 our places look nice as if this is where we're going to stay forever. We are just pilgrims passing through. And God doesn't mean it that we should not be comfortable. But some of us are really comfortable. You know what I mean. <laughs> Richard is laughing, but it's the truth. Some of us are really comfortable. You know, and, and with moment uh, you rock our world a little bit. Hey, what's going on, you know? And, and sometimes I even think we blame God. When, hey, what's going on, Lord? I have, is there something that I am doing wrong? You know, when there's a little bit of something going on, you know. I think the word is opulence. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. So, God said, come down back to earth. You guys are just passing through, you know. This isn't your home. You're looking for a better place. But we, we kind of put anchors down as if this is it, people. You know, I have my own little fortress here, my own little mansion here. This is my domain. And don't anyone interfere with me. Good. So, now there's another story that we maybe just look at quickly and see if we can gain, gain something from it. It's a very well-known story. Matthew uh, chapter 19 Let's just go over to Matthew 19, and you know the story very well, but we, it's, we need to look at it again today. Uh, Matthew 19, and let's read verse 16 through 22. Matthew 19, 16 through 22. Somebody read that for us? Okay, go ahead. Yeah. And behold, one came and said unto him, Yes. Good master, what good thing shall I do that I may be, have eternal life? And he said unto him, Why callest thou me good? There is none good but one, and that is God. But if thou wilt enter into life, mm -hmm. keep the commandments. He said unto him, Which, Jesus said, thou shalt do. No murder, mm -hmm. thou shalt not commit adultery, thou shalt not steal, yes. thou shalt not bear false witness. Honor thy father and thy mother that thy thou shalt love the Lord as thyself. Okay. Verse 20. Yes. The young man said unto him, All these things have I kept from my youth. Yes. Oh, what like I yet? And Jesus said unto him, If thou wilt be perfect, go and sell that thou hast, and give to the poor. Thou shalt have treasure in heaven and come and follow me. When the young man heard that saying, he went away sorrowfully, for he had great possessions. Then said Jesus unto him. That's 22. Okay. That's 22. Good, 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 good. So we know the story of this young man, right? Very sincere. He ran up to Jesus and said, nah, I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to ask Jesus this one question, you know? And he was hoping to be validated by Jesus. You know, and he even started by saying, good master, the, just to get some brownie points. So he said, good master. And Jesus had to remind him, there's no one good, really. I mean, stop you right there. I mean, one is good, God, yeah, and so forth and so forth. But then, then we see how he was even able to tell Jesus his upbringing. He said, I, you know, these things you are mentioning is, is, is what I grew up with, you know. So how does this young man differ from the rich man? How does this young man, this young ruler, how does his story, in his case, differ from the rich man? What did you say? There was no love okay. in his heart uh -huh. for the poor. Okay. Because God saw in his heart that he had great possessions, but did not want to share with others. Mm -hmm. And for him to share, 
He has to sell everything he has. Give to the poor. Yes. And then follow Jesus. Yes. Let's say if he sold everything he has and gave to the poor. Yes. But did not follow Jesus. He will not have a perfect life. Okay. All right. Good. Good statement. He didn't, he didn't really love God. Okay. I mean, he had all these possessions. Uh, but if he really loved Jesus. Yes. He would have gave his things to anyone. He didn't have yes. to be the poor. It just, but Jesus said, give them to the poor. Yeah. But he didn't really love Okay. God. That's the real problem. Is that, and we know that Jesus brought up the last um, of the Ten Commandments. Yes. The five, well, I think, seven down. Yeah, and it was the one that he didn't mention was <laughs> the covetousness. He didn't, he didn't, he didn't mention anything about yeah, covetousness. About the covet, yes. And he didn't mention about the other one, love God. Yes, yes, yes. You know, um, so, because, and that's where the problem lies. Yes. In, in the young man's heart. Yeah. Was that, he loved things um, more than God. Mm -hmm. and, and the sad part about it is, when you make the two comparisons, the rich young ruler thought he was on the path, yes. going the right way, whereas the other one, he could care less. He didn't yeah. seem to care. Absolutely right. And I think that's where the crux lies, right? <clears throat> right. He, he, the, the other gentleman was just living and doing his business and wanting to secure for himself more and more and secure himself for the future, but this young guy, he was a professed good Christian, but not a good steward. He was a good professed Hebrew. Yes. Because Christianity was not yet a religion at that time. Yeah, we are today. We are good Christians. We are even in the right faith. We are on the right, right path, as Jane was saying. But how are we steward-wise? We're doing all the right things over here, but are we doing the right things over here? Am I a good steward, or am I just a good Seventh-day Adventist Christian? Let's label it properly. Uh, if you say a good, a good Christian, it's not good enough. Good Seventh-day Adventist Christian. It's better, but am, am I just happy to be a good Seventh-day Adventist Christian and not a good steward? No. Remember Pastor Glenn made a statement not too long ago and the people, some didn't like it. He said you could be a Seventh-day Adventist and not a Christian. Right? And what are you, what are you talking about? Well, well what, what am I talking about? You know, that's the problem with us. You know, the moment we say something that, 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 that you know, that is in the face, then we ruffle our feathers, you know. Hey, what are you talking about? Well, God is speaking to your heart. Some of us have been in this truth for years and years and years. But is, is the truth taking a hold of us? Or are we just walking, walking in the path, happy? We are just good, you know. You were good last year. You were good the year before. Can, can you be better this year for God? Instead of just being good all the time? There are many people that are good. There are many people that are good. Are you just one of them? Good at the traditions. Right? Yes. Yes. Tradition, yeah. Going through the formalities. Just marching to time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Drill down path. Yes. They know all of the theory and know all of that. Yes. But they are... Tradition is more yeah. important than, exactly. than the love of God. Yeah, yeah. And that's the problem. You know, we know the ritual, we know the scriptures, we know all the doctrines, but that's the kind of where it stops. We're not prepared to go a little beyond. You had your hand. Sure. Yeah. When you think about it, yes. thou shalt not murder, thou shalt not commit adultery. Those yeah. are very obvious sins. Yes. But when you talk about covetousness, yes. that's we are affected sometimes it's cannot be seen yes but god could see our hearts yes that we have that selfishness in us yes it's just like natural for us human beings nobody would say oh be be greedy be selfish because it's nature it's we are greedy we are selfish yes. we are covetous we like things that we don't have 
Even if we have already a lot of things, we think we need more, more. So that selfish, selfishness within us in our hearts, and only God can see that. Yes. And that's why this is the problem of the young man. Yes. And so, yeah, by the power of God, that's the only way we can be. We can I agree with you 1%. Jane? I don't think that we all need to examine ourselves, like Paul said, yes. to see if we're in the faith. Yes, yes. Yeah. You know, we can be fooling ourselves. Yes. Even though we come every Sabbath and yes. motions, we need to examine ourselves to see if we are really in the faith. Yes. Take stock of ourselves. Yeah. Thank Nobody else needs to take inventory. You need to take inventory. I'll ask God to reveal to you. Yes the things of your heart. Yes. Quite naturally, none of us really want to do that. Yeah, exactly. Because he's afraid he will show something yeah. that we really don't want to get up, give up. But, yeah, exactly right. But we need to do it anyway. We need to do that. It's, uh, but, but have you noticed something in the story in, of, this, of this young ruler? Why does, why does Jesus ask the young ruler to give up all his possessions rather than just a portion of it? Well... <laughs> Have you noticed that? Yeah. He said, give all. I mean, uh, come on, Jesus, are you really serious? You want this young man to give all? Can you give a portion? So, read. Yeah, uh, well, with <laughs> Jesus, you have to give all. You can't keep some sin and give some sin. You know, give, I give uh, 90% of the sin, but I'll keep 10%. Uh, that was his sin because God named everything else murder, stealing, yes. adultery, bearing false witness, yes. the honor of the Father. He just left off the sin that the young man was guilty of and then asked him, be convicted on this, confess it, and follow me. So the Holy Spirit was working on the young man to convict him yes. that this is what he's talking about. Yes. This is the one, the 10th commandment. Yeah. And then if you're convicted on it, confess, cooperate with the Holy Spirit, and you can be saved. Yeah. And it hurts. It love hurts. The Bible says, yes. <clears throat> love not the world. Neither the things that are of this world. Yes. This rich young man, he loved all his possessions, okay? For if your love is in this for the things of this world, the love of the Father is not in him. Yes. 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 So okay. but if you he failed in that he didn't have any love in his heart. Okay, that, that, that I agree with you. Yeah. But if you're gonna follow Jesus, it's just like the other disciples. You notice they left their job, their occupation, they left their parents and everything, to follow Jesus. And that same requirement is also for him. He must leave all to follow me. Exactly. And that's true, right? Now, we also have to take it in context, because only God knows the heart, right? Mm -hmm. If God had to say to you or to me, you know, uh, I know you have a family, I know, but I'd like you to clear your bank balance and give it to the poor. I know you've got money there. It, it, is, that, is that right? Or would you interpret that to mean, Give some of what you have, or should you give all that you have? It depends on your condition. Well, well, yeah, yeah, it depends, right? So that's why I said because God knows the heart, He will ask you to give, right? And in this case of this young man, like you've already said, he needed a complete, he needed a complete understanding of what it means to follow Christ. He needed a total conversion of his heart. He needed a clean slate to start on. Because here he was going all this time, walking the spiritual road, and yet not, not getting it. Not getting it. That it's not about you. Because he said, I've kept all this of my youth up. I, I'm, a, I, I'm a really a good person. Well, it's not about you. It's about God. You know, if you love God supremely, you will give supremely. So he needed that. He needed total trust in God. And both these people, the guy with the bonds, this young man, they put money before God, and money then became their God. You know, they were not willing to part with it. So where do you see yourself? Where do I see myself? You know, is, is that what's going to hinder me? You know, uh, that's a question that we have to solve by ourselves. You know, God gives, freely gives. Are we willing to freely give to others, to his cause and to others? 
So, the last part of the lesson deals with making the right choice. Remember, it's a choice between God and mammon. And here we have several text verses here. Uh, we know some of them all by heart. Why do we make the choice? We do John 3.16. And it says, simply says, our favorite text in the Bible, for God so loved the world that he gave, he gave everything. Why do we choose him? Because he gave everything to us, right? He gave his only begotten son. He cleared heaven. He emptied heaven. And then Jesus, in turn, was willing to give up his, 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 uh, his godly possessions in heaven. He was rich. He was the creator. He's the creator of the world. Everything belongs to him, but he was prepared to step down and come and do that. So we, make, we, we want to choose him because he gave everything. Why shouldn't we give everything? It's as simple as that, right? Romans 5, 6, 6 and 8 says what? what? What do we read in Romans 5, 6, for 8? For when we were yet without strength, yes. in due time Christ died for the ungodly. Yes. For scarcely for a righteous man will one die, yes. yet peradventure for a good man some would even dare to die. Yes. But God commended his love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Oh, man. That just blows your mind. I mean, we did nothing good for him at the time. Way back, and he saw us in the timeline. There we will be in the 21st century but I'll die for him anyway. I'll die for her anyway. You know, those who nailed his hands, pierced his side, he died for those people. Those who spit on his face, he died for them. Were their sins forgiven? Yeah. Well, if they asked for it, oh yeah, they had the same choice. If they just made the right choice, anyone, I mean, the worst criminal, if you come to Jesus with a sincere heart, he is willing and able to forgive you right to the uttermost. And that's a reason to choose him, to make the choice. Yeah, it's only uh, a figure of the woman. Yes. Because it did not apply to the fallen angel. That's true. That's true. They, they had sealed their doom. When they left, they would, they just, they, that was it for them, you know, and, and they couldn't come back. Colossians chapter 1 says what? 13 and 14. And then we'll. Yeah. Yes. Yes. In whom we have redemption through his blood, even the forgiveness of sins. Oh, man. He is willing to forgive us our sins. He is our Redeemer. He paid the price. You know, there's nothing that you and I can add to that. He just paid the price with my life. You know, uh, we, we may. In, in, in Romans says, Paul says, we may for a good man, we may, <laughs> but, but for a sinner, <laughs> I know second, second, man, no, 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 not for that guy, that killer, you know, for Charles Manson, no, nah, I don't think so, uh-uh, you know, but maybe for a good guy, you know, I will. No, no, Jesus, he died for every, he redeemed us all with the same price. And then in Romans chapter 10, verse 9 and 13, it goes back to Romans. What does it say? Beautiful text. Romans 9. What does it say to us? That if thou shalt confess with thy mouth yes. the Lord Jesus, and shalt believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. Amen. And verse 13. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord yes. shall be saved. Oh, yes. So it doesn't matter. We have a very benevolent, gracious God, gracious Father. And it doesn't matter what we did in the past. He's always there to listen and to forgive. His mercy endureth forever. His grace covers everyone. And then... Ellen White in Desire of Ages says this last thought, the blessings of salvation are for every soul. I mean, that, you just think of, just that soak in. The blessings of salvation, this whole plan of salvation was 
instituted for every soul. No one should say, oh, but it's just for the rich, it's just for the poor, it's just for the... No, 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 no. Every single one who calls on the name of the Lord, the blessings are available. Salvation has been given to all. Nothing but his own choice, though. Nothing but his own choice can prevent any man or woman from becoming a partaker of the promise in Christ by the gospel. So there we have the choice. We must just make the choice. That's all you and I have to make. And say, Lord, you are the one. I choose you again and again and again. I choose you to worship. You know? But our actions should show it, though. You know? We can say with our lips, but our actions should show it. You know? And how do we see it in our actions? How, do we, how, how, how can others see it in our actions? How can you yourself see it in your actions that you have chosen Christ? Okay. No, the, the duress, yeah? Yeah, when the compressors uh, went to Mesoamerica, yeah. there was a sword in the hand. Yeah. You want to be a Christian or you want to stay uh, an uh, American Indian worshipping uh, paganism, you know? Yes, Indian yes. Paganism? Well, I want to be a Christian, so yeah. I'm spared. Yeah. That happened a lot in the, then uh, Mesoamerica, and that's why yeah. 30,000 of them became Catholics. The same number of Protestants that left the Catholic Church in Europe. Yes. You know, yeah. the New World Catholics were former pagans. Yeah. They became Christians because of the sword. Yeah. That's how Christianity was spread. Yeah. But, so, but, but uh, what, what we're saying is, you know, even they cannot read your heart. Those people that are persecuting you, right. they cannot read your heart. Right. So, uh, but what we're saying here is, Remember what Paul was saying two, two weeks ago in, when we read that? Be not conformed to the world, but be he transformed by your mind. You know, really, your heart. Your heart is your mind. So you, we must have this mindset that this is what I do. And it will show in your life. You know, the way you see how people have changed is the way they now approach. They're not, they're not living that lifestyle they used to. Now they are different. And people will know that. You know, when you have accept Christ in your life, your speech changes, your attitude changes. You know, uh, your workmates will know there's a difference in you. you know, if they can't see the difference, then there's nothing happened in your life. If you're still the same person, you know, there needs to be growth. There needs to be grow a pattern of growth. That's why I said, if you were good last year, and you were good the year before, and you plan to be good this year, it doesn't show growth. You're just good. But every year we should try to be better. God wants us to be better. We need to grow and mature. But if I'm just happy to be good, many Catholics are good. Many Muslims are good. There are a lot of good people around. But they don't really have a heart change and a mind change. You know what I mean? That's the secret. When, when we give our hearts and minds to God, then He takes control of our lives and people will see it. We are different. We are lovely to be around. We, we are not avaricious. We are not going after money. We give to causes. And, and those are the active things that will show in the life. You know, We don't hold on to our monies. When there's a need, we give. Now, some people will think, Hey, but I don't have all that money to give. You know how many causes there are? And there's a lot. Even with, just within our own organization, right? We've got uh, Breath of Life. We've got Signs of the Times. We've got the Blind. We've got Edra. We got, if you name it, there's dozens of them. Now, who, I don't, how can I give to all these people? Hmm. Well, God's not asking you to give to all these people. He wants you to but, give everything. But no, no. But well, he'll clean you out if you're ready. But I mean, what he's asking you to do, he wants to see if you're willing to give. You know, it's like giving, it's like giving our offerings. You know, you don't measure yourself against other people. You may give a dollar, like we said in the class this morning, Rufo. I may be able to give a dollar. Chloe, you can give ten. Now, I shouldn't feel bad about it. You can give because that's the way God has blessed you, right? But I'm giving. 
the lady gave two mites and, and Jesus said she gave more than the guy who gave 10,000 this morning. Well, God, how does that work? She only gave two mites. Well, she gave her heart. She gave, she gave from the heart. She gave everything she had. Don't you get it? Because God doesn't want equal giving. But what does he want? Equal sacrifice. That's what he wants. She sacrificed on her level, and, that, and you sacrificed on your level. That's what God wants. He wants equal sacrifice, not even total. Because we, none of us have, you know, we're not there. But if our hearts are right, and we give according to what we have with a good, cheerful heart, that goes miles than the person with a bag of money and says, hey, I got 10 more bags there. Ah, let me give this back. I got my other stash there. Ah, that's not, that's not, <laughs> you know what I mean? It didn't touch my millions. <laughs> yeah. Oh, I can make it up again, man. I got some deals coming up. He forgets that God's giving the deals. That he's stashing over there. It's not his. God is giving it. And so, yeah, that this mind be in you. If we, our mind, we need a renewal of the mind. And it will show in our, our daily living. That's where it will show. And uh, people will see it. The church will know it, your wife, your husband will know it, that you're not tight with money, you know, you rather, hey, I need a new pair of shoes, but yeah, these, these, can still, these can still go, maybe next month or so I can, you know, but just to be, everything you see, you know, there's coupons out, like I said this morning in Sabbath School, mm -hmm. uh, two for the price of one, hey, yeah, maybe I can get two for the price of one, but you don't need two, you only need one, <laughs> you know, and the human being is sucked in so, so quickly, you know. Let's take the bargain. Let's take the bargain. But you don't need uh, 10 bags of sand. You need one bag. Yeah, but you need, there's a bargain going at Menard, you know. If I pay, if I, uh, for $10, I can get 10. You only need one. Maybe you can give the other $5 to the church. You know, so, so we have to be wise. And the Holy Spirit will guide us and show us how to, how to live when our hearts are truly on the right place. Okay, well, let's say a prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you again for your wonderful word that teaches us so much about you. Lord, we learn day by day of how to live. And when we look at the life of Christ and all those who followed him, his disciples, we want to be like them. We want to be like you. Give us open hearts, Lord. Give us clear understanding because we, we really want to be saved in your kingdom. But help us to walk this life day by day doing what we should. Help us to not be afraid of sacrificing for you because you gave all and you're just asking us to be faithful in the little that we have to share and not that that may be our experience. We want to be ready when Jesus comes, Lord, and we just pray that you, by your Holy Spirit, lead us day by day to get ready and we ask it in the very powerful name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Well, thank, thank you. you.